So let's go back to talking about you've went to the bank, you've secured the loan, you've you found a truck, um, you've got the truck purchased. Um, let's we're gonna go ahead even say you got the trailer purchased, you got all that purchased, own it. What's the next step on licensing? I think this is where people get confused on how, what needs to be set up in the process of getting a truck legally on the road. Well, before you even get to the licensing part, your lender is going to want that truck insured. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right. <laughs> and then to uh, get your authority to operate your fleet. And you'll need insurance before you even get your authority, I believe, yes, too, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. absolutely correct. You will need to get your insurance before you put the truck on the road, it'll need to have physical damage. So all three of those answers are insurance. Then you get to the point of registering with your state, doing your 2290 with the IRS, uh, drug screens. If you're, Even for yourself, one truck, you you got to purchase queries from the, the, the FMCSA or go through a third party. It'll do it for you uh, to do your drug screens because the uh, clearing house that FMCSA has now, the National Clearing House, when I take a drug test, the results are registered with the FMCSA, especially if they're bad results. They they want to get the, the people that are probably shouldn't be off the on the road off the road. And the best way to do that is, hey, you know, he's got to go through this program before he can even requalify to drive OTR. You know, and just kind of break that down a little bit because, like, some of that's even still unclear to me how that works. So when you're, when you're, I mean, if you're the owner and you're going to be driving it or you're going to have a driver underneath you, they have to get a drug screen, mm -hmm. and that's got to be submitted. Yes, through the FMCSA yes. and approved before that driver can. Well, the truck. approval process, you come up clean on your screen. The result gets submitted to the FMCSA. You're good to go. Add to that, you got to do a back one truck operation. You still got to run your MVR on yourself every year and submit. You know, keep it on record. Because uh, trucking companies are required once per year to run MVRs on all drivers in their fleet. Is that a certain time of year or is it just once a year? Typically, most companies do it around July, but I don't think there's an actual set period as long as there's something in your established procedures uh, that you have a policy. That you, because I remember working for one company that did it on your anniversary year, and then most companies, it was mid-year, end of quarter or two. And they... Okay. I want to actually backpedal a little bit too. A lot of people, you know, and I'm going to try to throw everything we can, you know, even before... Uh, that per, that person gets licensed or gets approved the drug screening, he's got to carry a CDL as well. And that's a bigger hurdle now, too, because yep. you require accredited training. So it's no longer, you know, hey, I, I drove with my uncle for a while under a, a learner's permit, a CDL learner's, and I went and took my dr uh, driver's test. Now you got to have so many hours for the air brake component all the different components of driving, take that written test from an accredited uh, school training right? yeah. uh, school, then take the test again at the DMV and then get licensed after your driver's test. And all that gets submitted to the FMCSA. Uh, it's supposed, it's regulated by, I don't know how much gets actually submitted. You're talking to an accounting guy, not a safety <laughs> guy. <laughs> so. Okay. Well, let's, Go back to talking about just the licensing of that truck with, with the FMCSA, getting your authority, and what does that really mean? Okay, getting your authority means you have the authority to operate interstate. As far as FMCSA, you actually go through your state of record to get your authority. Uh, actually, you go through USDOT and FMCSA to get your authority to register your truck you go through your state, you know, where your business is and through your state. And every state has different procedures on that. Every one of them have websites that kind of guide them through. Some states are better than others. And, you know, I always say do it yourself. Learn how the process goes. But, you know, the alternate route, there are third-party entities that yep. will do that all for you. They're, typ they're typically called permitting businesses. Permitting There's services. one here locally in Springfield called the Permit Shop, which we recommend <laughs> all the time. Um, pageant. She's yeah. been on our show, welcoming me to go back to previous episodes and listen to her. But there are companies because I think that's it can get in the weeds there. Trying someone trying to understand how to get set up and if you can just pay someone to do all that for you. Yeah, it's a boggle, but it's a it's just a bureaucratic boggle. 
It's paperwork. None of it is rocket science. It's just you got to have patience and time to take take time to read. You know, it's just like putting together your kids' toy at Christmas. You got to read the directions. When you're getting set up to, you know, there's certain having your authority and being a portion for certain states. Can you kind of talk about that? Because you know, you can get set up right just to run in trust state. So we're in Missouri, so you're that truck's never going to leave the state. But then you can also get a portion to run when the surrounding get, states and then but you can get a portion to run all 48 how does that really work? well now when and, you and why is that because I, I mean it's really you're paying more to run more states right now when you get your irp cab card uh, what does that mean and what is you would have to have to, okay. that. <laughs> I'll have to look it up later but no uh, when you get your cab card or your registration it used to be you had to select the states you would operate. Now they automatically assign you all 48. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. So that's not an issue anymore. Now there's some oddball states that have their own fuel permitting process that's outside of IFTA. Oregon comes to mind. I think New Mexico too. Colorado used to. They're kind of on again, off again. Uh, but now interstate... You're not even going through the FMCSA. You're going through your state of record, whatever their interstate authority and registration requirements are. Some are really simple. Some are just as uh, involved as FMCSAs. But interstate, you, you can't go outside the state. I guess, you know, back in my day when I was, when we were hiring trucks, I worked at Bartlett Grain, you know, there were some trucks, hey, we have a load going I'm just saying Kansas down into Texas. Well, I, I could always remember some haulers like, well, I can't run Texas or because I can't they run. Didn't put it on the IRP. Yeah. Okay. So there, but you say today though, they register where you're all 48 or. Yes. Okay. So that's not the case as of today, like no. it used to be. Okay. And I think the FMCSA did that at the urging of the ATA because they did run into their owner operators. Say, hey, I don't have that on my cab card. I'm sorry. I'm not going there. <laughs> but, I, but I will say from an insurance perspective, your insurance um, company that you're going to work with, they are going to want to know what states that you're going to be operating in. They're right? going to want to know. As far as your, your quote and premium. But unless you're doing something really, way, an insurer way outside the normal commercial trucking insurance spectrum, they already know that that truck is going to be insured wherever you're tagged. Okay. That makes sense. Talk about when we're when we're talking about getting licensed and all that. So we've kind of walked through the process of getting set up and and, and getting your card. What is the ongoing reporting that has to be done on that truck as a business owner? Because it's not like you don't get set up and then you're just, you know, okay for, once a year. But I know that there's certain things that that truck or that that company has to report through the FMCSA. There's two things that are separate, and this is actually Department of Treasury IRS. Once a year, July 15th is your 2290, your heavy highway use tax. Right now, it's been the same for years, $550 a year. Per company? Per truck. Per truck, okay. And then outside of that, and it flows through your state, is the IFTA agreement that it's intrastate federal tax agreement where all the states agree to collect out of one pool their individual tax rates where the truck operates. Uh, so you have to make a quarterly report on your IFTA, and if sometimes you'll be owed a refund, and it's just like any other tax, and sometimes you're paying in. But that's based on your mileage per state and gallons consumed per state. So talk about in simple terms, because it can get confusing. So people always, and I have people ask all the time about IFTA. I know a lot of drivers we talk to, especially running fuel cards, they have to they have to keep track of that so they know. But how does that work? So I'm in Missouri, and but I'm going to be crossing over and filling up in Oklahoma. I'm going to be filling up in Arkansas. Well, today, most of your fuel card providers will do your IFTA reporting for yep. you. Uh, another route to go... A lot of your ELD providers will do your if IFTA reporting for you too. Even if you do the taxes yourself, you can pull your IFTA reports miles per state. Then you got to fill in the blank of how many gallons you filled in, in each state. 
Uh, I don't say permit shops do that as well. Right. You, you, they'll outsource and do all that for you. But I think today, and I'm not down downplay whichever's easier, but like with technology today, ELDs, it, from what I've heard, it's not that hard to do. No, it's not. It's and uh, like I say, the, the hardest part when you got a fleet of more than five to 10 trucks is making sure you have all the mileages accurate, you know, and if you're dependent on drivers turning in receipts, you know, the safety person may not have easy access to the fuel card account and they're having to get that information to give an accurate report because you don't want to fuel audit. It's state of Kentucky. If they find you uh, non-compliant in fuel tax payment, you'll have to post a fuel bond. And the amount varies, but usually it's a minimum of thousand to five thousand dollars to operate in their state. So you want to make sure your IFTA is right just as much as anything else in your trucking operation. Wow! And and again, just to reiterate, you said that's done how often? Quarterly. Quarterly. Okay. And typically, um, if you're running four or five trucks, usually the owner of that company's collecting those receipts, or how are he's getting that collection right of all those fuel tickets. Yeah, to do that reporting. And the reason being, I always had a rule of thumb when I drove or was an owner operator. If I drove more than 50 to 100 miles in that state, I usually stopped and fueled at least once or twice in a monthly period. That usually balanced out my IFTA where I didn't pay that much, maybe 20 or $30, or I got a refund. So, but if you fuel all in one state that's a low tax state and you go in high tax states, you're going to pay in. If you live in Kansas, whose fuel tax is higher in Missouri's and you fuel all the time in Kansas, you'll get a refund all the time. But you're paying more taxes at the pump. You're paying those taxes. That's a that's kind of like balancing your checkbook. They're reconciling how much in tax money you've actually paid versus what's actually due. Somebody told me one time, and maybe this is not as related to this, but like sometimes they say it's better to fill up in a high tax state. Because the actual cost of the fuel is less because of the tax is so high. Is there truth to that? Depends on how much you operate in high tax states. Like uh, if you're in East Coast, which most of your audience, I'm assuming, doesn't. You're always, uh, you always benefited fueling in Pennsylvania once or twice in that run because their taxes were higher in New Jersey's. But New Jersey's fuel prices were cheaper because they had cheaper taxes. So, again, it's a matter of whether you're paying it now at the pump or paying it later in your IFTA. So it's a balancing act. But in the end, it's a pee and a shell game. It's just a tax payment you have to keep track of. 